What's good, ladies and gents? Welcome to Legacy Studios Now. My name is Paul the Fifth. 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 Real quick, just wanted to apologize for not getting much content out over the last week. The reason for that, my van has been in the shop getting fixed after the wreck in December. I've been working from home lately and didn't think that putting content out from my apartment was gonna be too great. But now that I'm back in the studio, what did you think about that artwork? Well, it came from a book that I got when I was a youngster. The main character was a kid named Julian and his grandfather had taken him to a jazz club. Those pictures play a role into today's video. Today's topic is the first video of a two-part series that I'm putting together and it's all about the past. I'm talking about some of the first data recording devices, their inventors, a few names that you might know and a few that you might not. And I'll be sharing with you the background of Pro Tools and Logic. And anything in life is good to know about the past, right, in order to be able to move forward. My next video, I'll be breaking down Pro Tools and Logic, some of their differences and some of the things that they have in common. All of my content up until this point has been showing you some of my gear, what I got, and some good gear to get for yourself if you're a first time beginner. Why don't you join me on this little venture? You ready? Let's go! go. Show real! Before I start talking about our modern day DAWs, Pro Tools and Logic, let's take a trip back into history so we can really understand and know where the beginnings of music production began. As we are made in his image, I imagine that our very first ancestors, maybe Neolithic man and some cavemen probably began knocking sticks and stones and tapping their feet and, and coming up with rhythmic ideas and those have translated into our current society where we're able to record those rhythms and use our voices, snap our fingers, clap our hands and tap our feet and turn those into musical digital recordings. Join me now as I take you back to our earliest beginnings. Here we go. go, go. Upon some research that I did dating all the way back to 1881, there is a Frenchman and his name was Clement Adair. I imagine I'm saying his name incorrectly. If I do, many apologies. He created a system using a telephone and a stereophonic sound system. The first practical sound recording and reproduction device was the mechanical phonograph cylinder and that was invented by none other than, you guessed it, Mr. Thomas Edison. That was done in 1877 and he put a patent on that one year later in 1878. The invention soon spread across the globe and over the next two decades, the commercial recording and distribution and sale of sound recordings became a growing new international industry with the most popular titles selling millions of units by the early 1900s. In 1922, there was a British man. His name was Charles A. Hoxie. I'm probably saying his name wrong. If I am, I apologize. Last name, H-O-X-I-E. And he created a device called the Palophotophone. Probably saying that wrong too, but that was a device that lets you record optically in 35 millimeter film. And some formats allowed the user to record up to as many as 12 tracks in parallel on each strip. Fast forward a few years, British EMI engineer, Alan Blumline, hence the Blumline microphone technique, he had a patent for some recording, stereophonic sound, and surround sound on disc and film. That was done in 1933. The history of modern multi-track audio recording using magnetic tape began in 1943 with the invention of stereo tape recording, which divided the recording head into two tracks. Then we fast forward a little further to 1950, and this is where the next major development in multi-track recording comes into place. 
And this is when a company called Ampax Corporation devised the concept of an eight track recording system using the cell sync or selective synchronous recording system. And the first such machine was sold to musician Les Paul. And then for 35 years, multi-track audio recording technology was largely confined to specialists in radio, TV, and music recording studios, primarily because multi-track tape machines were both very large and very expensive. And the first Ampax 8-track recorder was installed in Les Paul's home studio in 1957. And guess what? And at the time, it cost a whopping USD of $10,000, roughly three times the average yearly income in 1957, and equivalent to around $90,000 in 2016. Fast forwarding to 1961, Rupert Neve formed Neve Electronics. So Mr. Neve began designing and building mixing consoles for recording studios. He started out by designing and building a mixing console for a composer, Desmond Leslie from Castle Leslie, where the original desk is still housed. He built a transistor-based mixing console with an equalizer for Philips Recording Studio in London in 1964. One of his customers during the period was The Beatles, and the producer was none other than George Martin. He sold his company Neve Electronics and he worked with Manchester-based Amtrak Systems in 1975. We lost Mr. Neve in February of 2021. May your soul be rested and thank you sir for all you did for the audio industry and the world. All right, just went over some people that were some of the founders of the audio industry and talked about some of the things they did and products that they made to lead us up to today. So now I wanna take just a little bit of time to talk more in depth about a few other things. Let's go. go. I have a Wikipedia link and let's take a look there at some of the very first recording systems. So what is sound recording and reproduction? Sound recording and reproduction is an electrical, mechanical, electronic, or digital inscription and recreation of sound waves such as spoken voice, singing, something I'm terrible at, instrumental music or sound effects. The two main classes of sound recording technology are analog recording and digital recording. In an upcoming episode, I'll be showing you signal flow on an analog console versus a digital platform. Moving on, on, on. Early history. Long before sound was recorded, music was recorded. First written by music notation, then also by mechanical devices, wind up music boxes, in which a mechanism turns a spindle which plucks tines, thus reproducing a melody. Pretty cool article. Some of the first recordings were known from the 1560s in the Rosslyn Chapel. Some of the first recording mechanisms. Number one, I'm probably gonna say this wrong, but the phonograph. This first device could record actual sounds as they pass through the air, but could not play them back. And this is the gentleman we can give credit to for that device. Then we have the phonograph. I'm sure you all have heard of that. Then the phonograph cylinder. That was made around this time of year in 1887. The inventor's name, Mr. Charles Cross. I'm sure that this next name is a household name. Mr. Thomas Edison. The first practical sound recording and reproduction device was a mechanical phonograph cylinder invented by Thomas Edison in 1877 and patented in 1878. Pretty cool information there. The next device, the disc phonograph. Couple names here. This is our inventor, patented in 1887. Though others had demonstrated similar disc apparatus, you also may know this name, Alexander Graham Bell. The discs were easier to manufacture, transport, and store, and they had the additional benefit of being marginally louder than cylinders. Very cool. A double-sided, nominally 78 RPM, so like disc was the standard consumer music early format from the 1910s to the late 1950s. Some more cool information about that device. Moving on to electrical recording. The sound recording began as a purely mechanical process. A lot of great information here. I'm not gonna read all of this, but you can read that in the link I'll leave in the description at your convenience. 
other recording formats. In the 1920s, phonofilm and other motion picture sound systems employed optical recording technology in which the audio signal was graphically recorded on photographic film. This is a very cool article, you can go through that. Then magnetic tape. This brings me back to my time frames as a kid growing up in the 80s. We would have the cassette tape. Some recording consoles used in those 70s and 80s were the SSL consoles, which are still prevalent today, as well as Neve consoles. And these would use usually two inch thick tape. Check out this little clip of a video I did at my time at the recording workshop. So here's the article about tape, stereo and hi-fi. Very cool information here as well from the 1950s through the 1980s. This takes me back to my childhood growing up from 1980 through about 1992 when CDs came out. But I would use a boom box and I would put that cassette tape, a blank tape into that boom box. I would hit the record and play at the same time. So if something was played on the radio, I could record that. And one of my very first tapes that I ever purchased as a kid was the Wayne's World soundtrack in, I think, 1992. Moving on, audio components, digital recording. Compact Disc came out in 1982. Software, cultural effects, legal status, US, UK. A lot of great information on this article. And again, the link is in the description. Moving on to digital production. Avid was initially a company called DigiDesign. And that was started in 1984 by two guys. And their names were Peter Gotcher and Evan Brooks. Products. The flagship program was Pro Tools. Three variants, Pro Tools HD, Pro Tools LE, and Pro Tools Empowered. I was introduced to Pro Tools in 2008 when I was a student at the recording workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio. I was 28, I wanted to really get into this whole music production thing and I didn't know where to begin or how to get started. I Googled music production schools and came across the Rec W, so I went out there and at the time, everything was under the brand name of DigiDesign. And if you were a Pro Tools user at that point in time, it meant that you had to use specific DigiDesign products or interfaces. Let me show you some of my relics. This is my DigiDesign Inbox 2. When I got this in 2008, it was compatible with my Pro Tools version at the time, which was Pro Tools 7. Now, in April of 2021, we're on Pro Tools 2021.3, I believe. I got an email the other day that there's a new update out. Let me show you that. Check these out. For any of you old school guys and gals that have been doing this for a minute, you know what these are. These are the first versions of iLocks. These two here were for my 003 factory. I had lost this one initially, but then I got this one and then I found that one. So I had to call Sweetwater Tech Support and they helped me move all my licenses from this one to this one. And during that time, I had also purchased CDs, a compact disc that would have software that I could download. But I needed these for my licenses. These are extra iLocks. And now they're all replaced with this. That one is actually my iLock 2, and it's an old school one. It's the one that my dog Samson chewed up. You can see by those teeth marks right there, right? Now there's an iLock 3, which will hold up to 1,500 licenses. We've come a long way since 2008. Let's move on to Logic. Logic Pro is a digital audio workstation, DAW, and MIDI sequencer software application for the Mac OS platform. It was originally created in the early 1990s and known as Notator Logic by a German software developer, C-Lab, which later went by eMagic. And then in 2002, Apple acquired eMagic and named it Logic Pro. It is the second most popular DAW after Ableton Live according to a survey conducted in 2015. Yeah, so not sure about that one. Not sure who did that survey. I was not involved, but 
My personal preferences would definitely be Logic first, then Pro Tools. And here's some more information about Logic. And again, you can check out more of those details in the link in the description. Moving on. I want to tell you a little bit of my musical upbringing. I was born in December of 1980, and my dad, Mike, has played saxophone forever. He introduced me to jazz, Latin, funk, bossa nova, a little bit of hip hop, blues, and every Sunday in the 90s, I grew up listening to Casey Kasem's Top 100. So I feel like I'm very rounded when it comes to different types of musical styles. I bring this up because I wanna talk about some things a little bit later in this episode. So as someone that grew up listening to jazz, I also listen to artists like The Beatles. You may have heard of them. Have you ever really sat down and listened to some of those old jazz recordings from the 1920s and maybe some of The Beatles records? Most of those recordings only had one microphone. So in that room, let me set the setting. You would have your mic right up front. You may have your drummer back here. You may have your bass player over here. When I'm talking about bass, I'm not talking about your electric bass that you might know today. I'm talking about your upright bass. You may have a trumpet player over here and maybe another musician here. But well, let's say it comes time for the singer that might be standing up front by the mic to back off a little. And that trumpet player may have a solo. So you may have the microphone right up here and that trumpet player moves closer to the mic. When their solo is over, they may go back. When it comes time for the singer to sing again, they may come closer to that microphone as well. That's how some of those first recordings were done. I believe the Beatles only had maybe either four or eight tracks total. When it came to some of those earlier recordings, some of those musicians may have been moving around that room so that one microphone could capture things. That was very primitive as far as moving faders up and down to capture those selections. Wrapping things up here today, what did you think about today's video? Did you learn anything? I sure had a good time researching and learning about some of the audio past and some of the folks that helped us get to where we are today. Some of you may have found things a little boring, but that's okay because in anything that we do, it is so vitally important to understand where we came from, the folks that helped us get to where we are today so that we can have an understanding of how we can move forward in the future. This industry started with one or two tracks being recorded at a time, and then we moved into the 80s with large format analog consoles like we had at Soundstage Studios. Check out this pick of a 64 channel SSL J9000. I got to work on this when I was an intern at Soundstage Studios, and here's a picture of me clowning around in Studio A at SAE Institute. Speaking of the future, I have some major life changes coming up. That means I'll have more time to put out consistent content for you. Thanks so much for bearing with me lately. Don't forget, I'm giving away this brand new iPad once I earn 1,000 subs. So why don't you help me grow the channel, keep me accountable, and let's grow in this music production thing together. Before I go, check out some pics of some of my first setups. All right, ladies and gents, I appreciate you taking the time to watch today. If you found any value in this episode, go ahead and hit that thumbs up, leave some comments in the descriptions, and you know what to do. Smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. Stick with me because next time I'll be showing you some differences and similarities between Pro Tools and Logic. It's gonna be hella fun. You know who I am. My name is Paul the fifth. Yeah.